Welcome to Season 4 of the Get Out of Teaching podcast presented by Larksong Enterprises. This podcast is for teachers who are considering leaving education but feel like they have no options. I'm your host, Elizabeth Diakos. I'm a career transition coach who guides overwhelmed teachers through a five-step process out of education and into a life they love. I'd like to see a world where the work of teachers is valued and respected and that teachers have a career pathway that enables them to continue to offer value to society beyond their work in the classroom. So in this season, we'll be speaking to other experts who help people to change careers, as well as a few ex-teachers who forged a pathway into something new. So come along for the ride as we get out of teaching. Episode 9. Hi everyone and welcome to the show and on today's show I'm very pleased to be interviewing Bernadette Jansen who is the founder of the School of Renovating. Welcome to the show Bernadette. Oh thanks so much for having me Elizabeth. So Bernadette I'm really curious because I put out the call to people who who help teachers get out of teaching and I got an email from you and you said that you run this amazing organization. I just wanted you to maybe fill us in on what you actually do. Well, yeah, so um, so I have the School of Renovating and basically what I do is um, teach renovators, predominantly women, how to replace their income using renovating Airbnb property strategies um, and that might be to actually re- um, to get out of a job now or it might be someone who's poorly prepared for retirement and wants to just build their um, you know, their retirement savings. Okay. So uh, I've been using this uh, example of a, a lady, a teacher named Donna, who's 52, and she's decided she wants to leave teaching. She feels like she has no options and she's ill-prepared to move into another kind of work, or that's how she feels at least, yeah. even though she's got this amazing skill set as a teacher. What would you say to someone in her position? Okay, so um, I would say that if you have a, an interest and a passion for um, homemaking, for want of a better word, like if you're, you know, most of us as women love to have the home looking as best we can and um, and you have an interest in property, then renovating is a really um, amazing way to totally turn around your uh, financial fortune in some ways. I don't know whether that's the right word, but anyhow. So um, I just want to step back a bit and just say that um, a lot of women um, sort of tend to not look after themselves financially because that, you know, we're bringing up, as mothers particularly, we're bringing up children we're focused on their well-being and often we will get to 52 or you know mid 50s and think I'm doing something that I'm not really loving Mm -hmm. and um and but feel trapped and can't get out of it so that's where I think that renovating if you have that passion for homemaking is a great way to turn things around and so what we do is so in order to do a project you need to you've got to have some financial capacity Mm. and so you you need to either have the capacity to get a loan you need to have that and you need to have some cash which we usually get out of a line of credit on either a family home or another home and the time to do it so there's sort of the recipe for making a profit from renovating and um, so, sorry, just run through. So you need ready cash, you need well, a line or yeah. a line of credit, you yeah. need uh, the capacity to borrow some money. Yeah, on an inv- so you ha- you need to have the capacity to be able to buy an investment property, get the loan for an investment property. Yeah, and you also you need to have the time to do it, but it's usually four to six weeks. We we do what's called a cosmetic plus reno, which is a little bit more than a cosmetic r- reno, but not a full-on structural reno. And so, you know, you put those three things together, do a project. We work on around about 10% profit. So if you're looking at um, making, you want to make, say, 50,000 out of your project, you're looking at a project that's roughly 
you know, four to five hundred thousand. If you want to make a hundred thousand out of a project, you're looking at something that's between eight to nine hundred thousand. Now, there are lots of exceptions to those rules. Like I have women that are doing much bigger pro- profits in much lower price, price points, but that's how we base our feasibility. Now, so I've forgotten the name of your lady again. Donna. Donna. So Donna. So she's 52. Let's say, you know, she's she's in that boat and she's quite keen to get going. But let's say she's missing one of those components. Let's say she can she could probably get an investment loan, but she doesn't really have enough cash um, to be able to um, to do the project, which is often, you know, 30, sometimes even 40% of the value of the property. And right. so what we then do is we team up. Um, renovators. So two women will team up in what's called a joint venture and do a project together. And so they will do that until they build up enough capacity to be able to do them on their own. So um, that's what I would say to Donna, if you're interested in this Mm. and it's something that you want to do, um, that would be the path that you would go down. And then the next step on from there is would be, so buying, renovating and selling or flipping is um, is quite a short, it's not really an investment strategy. It's quite a short-term um, strategy because you sell the golden goose, you sell the property. And right. so then I'd be suggesting that she looked at other strategies for developing more of passive, like it's never truly passive, but more of a passive income using those property skills. But the first thing is to get that first project done and maybe two or three after that. So she's generated cash flow, replaced her income, and then she can start thinking about, you know, every one or two projects, maybe doing something that she can hold. Does that answer your question? I think so. So so what you're saying, just to me to kind of go back over that again, the first two or three you're using to flip and sell at a higher price than what you paid and make a profit. So then you've got your little nest egg there that you can then say the next project that I renovate, I'm going to hang on to it and maybe use it as an Airbnb or rent it out to someone. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And the other thing is that um, the other thing that we do is really look at what else you've got because you know, Donna may, um, she may have uh, have an empty nest and may be able to convert some of her home into, um, a, to have some earning capacity. And um, so we would look at that because, you know, uh, yeah, where there's possibility, we try and um, use it. Uh, and yeah, sorry. So, okay, go back to that, the, the earning capacity. So are you, are you thinking about something like rent a room out to a student, that kind of well, thing? No I'm, I, no, I'm not thinking about imposing on her lifestyle, but a lot of people, um, my generation, uh, have got to a stage where they're in a big house and, or, and don't have the need for it anymore, so they're rattling around with it wondering what to do. Mm. I would look at that house and see if we can do some minor adjustments to it so it could have something that was um, self-contained, um, like a, yeah, and so that they could um, either rent it on Airbnb or rent it on uh, long-term and have a potential income. Right, so with a separate entrance maybe in a little kitchenette. Mm, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I actually could see the potential in my house for that. We've, we've yeah. got a back entrance into the the back bedroom and there's a little bathroom right next to that so it's like an ensuite and then another bedroom that faces opposite that but they they're separate from the the lounge room like so there wouldn't be a, a lounge room as such but it no. could be like yeah. a, a kitchenette lounge room and then yeah. the bedroom and you could yeah. have a nice little kind of studio almost and so we have like because i i've, I've been doing airbnb l- since long before it was popular Mm. and um so I really I built up a program around it just so that our students could you know leverage what they had and we've had some really amazing results from that as well um the other thing is being a teacher and having I know that you work long hours with marking and whatever you know all the other stuff extracurricular Mm. stuff that happens um 
but you do get decent holidays. So I would be saying to Donna, don't toss in your job Mm -hmm. until you've done at least your first one project or two projects until you've established yourself because it's a lot less stress doing it when you're not relying on the income. And then you can, um, yeah, and once you've got a couple of projects under your belt, then you're in a position to be able to think, well, yes, so now I am I pretty much know what I'm doing so I can, yeah. So that would be like a great six-week summer holiday project. Yeah. Perfect for that. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then sell it off before the school year starts. Yeah. Sounds too good to be true. So, okay, I'm a big fan of going to Bunnings and wandering the aisles. What sort of skills do you need to have to be able to do this? Because this sounds scary to me. It sounds like I need to be a carpenter and a plumber. No, well, that's what you don't need to be. So I I should just um, go back. I started renovating. I've been renovating for 35 years. So I was a nurse. Um, I trained at St. Vincent's in Melbourne, actually. And and, um. And I met my husband who was in the building industry who, um, and I thought that that was the recipe for the riches because I had a bit of an eye for design. He mm. was, um, a bu- you know, a builder. And, um, and so that's why we set off down that path. And so as we had children, we had four children ultimately, re- I renovated while, you know, Anne was a stay-at-home mum at the same time. Mm. And... Um, we got to a point when I really, and we DIY'd everything. Like he would do the roof frame and, you know, I remember tiling 40 square metres of tiles when I was nine months pregnant and all this stuff. And we got to the point where I thought we are really working for barely wages. This is not working. Mm. And I realised that that we'd made a fundamental mistake in that we thought it was all about the the construction side of it, but it's not. And that's where I think DIY really trips you up because you get so focused on you, you, you're down in the weeds and you can't see the woods for the trees for, you know, want of a better mm. word. And so I then I basically said, that's it. We're not doing any more DIY. We need to buy well enough that we can pay trades to do the work and still make a profit. And so, and it was really only then that we truly started making a profit. And it's it's really around, it's around firstly a strategy. And so, um, and so getting the right property, like you can have two properties side by side. One of them you can make a profit on. They can look identical. One of them you can make a profit on. The other one you can't because of how much you have to do to it to deliver the same outcome. Yes. So it's really making sure that you pick the right property, making sure that you know your market so you can deliver a a product that they're going to love, mm-hmm. making sure you're selling to an owner-occupier market, the ones that get really emotionally involved with your um, property, and just managing the budget, the trades, the time frame. Mm-hmm. So it's, a, it's an exercise in project management and it's something that I think, teachers are quite good at mm. well I mean anytime you do anything at the school that's bigger than just what's in your classroom it's a project so if you're organizing an excursion and you have to take 60 kids on two buses and take them to the art gallery and give them lunch and make sure they can all go to the toilet and then get them all home safely and don't leave anyone behind that's a project it's got a beginning a middle and an end so that's all it's it's just yeah. that isn't it and there's and all it the- is yeah and that the sound of that totally freaks me out because you're, <laughs> well, you're dealing with little people that are not necessarily rational. Yeah, whereas, they're wild cards. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, um, so it is just a process, and and that's what I have done is really refined the process to reduce the risk and to make it easier to manage. And so, yeah, and it's wow. fun. Yeah, I totally resonate with what you said about the owner occupier. We were looking for an investment property that we were actually going to put our daughter in if she because she wanted to move to a house with a backyard so she could have a dog. And we so we were just looking and we'd done our market research in the local area and we knew what we should be paying and we 
found a property, we got it valued. I think they valued it at around about six fifty, and it was just a weatherboard house, not on a huge block of land, much smaller block than our home, our family home, and but in a nice little pocket. It was okay, like not great, but location wise, but not bad. And in a good suburb, like the name of the suburb helped, even though yeah. that part of the suburb wasn't that great. And so it was valued at six fifty, and we thought we'll go to seven twenty. You know, that's about right, reasonable. It went for eight eighty, and it was at the start of this huge property surge at the start of this year. And we were just gobsmacked because the real estate agent kept coming over and said, you want to bid again? And we're like, no. But they obviously, this couple that bought it, you could just tell it didn't matter what happened, they were going to get that house at the end of the day. It didn't matter how much they had to pay. They were just yeah. there because they loved it. It was really cute. Like in that yeah. they'd done a nice job of, you know, styling it and everything and it did look really nice and very kind of homey. But yeah. They definitely paid too much for that house. <laughs> well, I think that about everyone that buys our renos. Um, right. Because, yeah, because we've expended all the um, opportunity in it. But mm-hmm. that's what we do and there's a market for it because not everyone has the capacity to renovate or has the stomach for it. So it's something that we love to do. And it was funny because one of my um, – so we have a program called Wonder Women. Wonder Women Renovators, and um, which is intentionally um, sort of what's the word out there because I really believe that we've got to own our power, not be shrinking violets. You've got to, we've got to get out there and 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 seize what we want out of life. So um, and so and she was talking about someone that she that they've been discussing their reno and she said to them, if you just do this and that, you know, it's only a minor reno, you'll add another 50,000 to it. Mm. And she said they just could not be bothered. Like, you know, they just said, oh, no, I couldn't do, I couldn't go through that. Mm. And so, yeah, it's interesting. So everyone has their thing Mm. and so, yeah. But the other thing, so... In the time that I've been doing this, I have discovered, you know, I've sort of worked through a lot of the problems that uh, that women, the women that we work with have, because one of the things is um, that I found was a big stumbling block was pressing the button on which property to buy. So right. someone would come through a training and then would be out there looking for months and months, even years, and just never quite have the courage to say, yeah, this is it. Mm. And so um, I had never worked with a buyer's agent before, um, but I started working with buyer's agents to test them to, you know, figure out who who's who in the zoo. Mm. Um, and so now we have a team of really great, incidentally, they're all female, buyer's agents who mm. will source the property for them and that makes a massive difference. Mm. Um, so, Yeah. And gives them confidence that they're making a good decision. Yeah. And, like, we all need that. It's not, um, you know, like even when I, I think unless you are in the market all the time, you need to take into account the opinions of others that are in the market. And mm-hmm. so that's one of the benefits of using a buyer's agent. Like if I'm, I don't always use a buyer's agent, but I will still get, the feedback from the agents, the local agents in the area, because I'm not at the opens every single Saturday. And yeah. that market knowledge is really important. Yeah. So do you only operate in Sydney or do you? No, well, technically, work? technically, yes, but practically no. Like I did a project in Queensland uh, not that long ago because a lot of um my students were doing um, what's called splitters, where they were buying um, properties two lots, two two lots on one title, and so I thought, oh, I better go and do one of those. So I did. I went to Queensland, and because there's a lot more of them there, I'm currently doing one in Newcastle. I, I've got a project. Um, I'm doing a project for my brother actually in Echuca. Okay. Um, and so I like to work locally, but um, I really just work where where the opportunities are best for what we're doing. So you're still doing that while you're training other people how to do it yourself as well? Yeah, I do about three projects a year. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. The that's other thing, 
Yeah, go on. The other thing that um, we're doing, and you'll be interested in this, is um, so we've got four young adult children and we wanted to make sure that they um, sort of got a start in life, but we weren't that keen on putting a hand into our own pocket to give them a deposit. So what we do, once they get their um, first full-time job is we do a project with them. So they go off and get the loan and we put the cash in from our line of credit and we do a project together. And then so we agreed that we would each of our kids would get a hundred thousand. So the first one we did with our daughter who lives in Melbourne. And so that was a two bedroom apartment. We had we made a hundred and fifty five thousand on that. So she got the hundred, we got the fifty. And then we did one with our right. son. That only made a hundred, so we didn't get a payday, but that was fine. And so I'm about my third daughter is actually a design and technology teacher, but she um, got married and had her first baby not long after she graduated. And so she then had three very quickly, one after the other. So we haven't really been able to do one with her because they have to be able to get a loan. That's sort of how it works. Mm. But she's now um, the youngest is um, almost going to preschool. So, and she's now said she doesn't want to go back to teaching because she sees her teacher friends working themselves to the bone and she doesn't want to do it. So, oh, so she's Christ- a teacher. Yeah, okay. yeah. So after Christmas, our, we're on mission, get Madeline into full-time renovating. So that's going to be my next um, quest. So wow. great to be able to help your kids and do it in a way where it's, you know, I just love the fact that as a family we ha- we always have a project to talk about. Um, it's, yeah, it's good. And it's like bringing them into the family business, isn't it, in a way? You're, you're able to, like, so we said to our children, you need to come and help us clean this house because this is going to be your, you know, one day this is what you'll inherit. Um, but, yeah, so the, the daughter that we put into the investment property when we did eventually find one, um, she actually had already bought herself a little unit. So she's renting that out. That's paying and she's paying us rent. Yeah. So it's not, she doesn't own it, we own it. Yeah. That all the bank really owns it, actually, truth be told. Um, okay, so what if someone wanted to, like you're, you've got your projects that you're running, but you're also doing this training for people. Yeah. Can you explain what that would look like? So I'm Donna. I ring you up and say, hey, Bernadette, I'm thinking I want to avail myself of your training. What what happens next? So what happens next is, um, so we have, so during COVID, I used to always do my trainings live, but during COVID I had to do the big, switch. So now, um, and I always resisted it because I was worried that you would not, you would lose that connection um, if it was online. But um, fortunately, that's not been the case. In fact, it's been the opposite. And so we have our training online in nine modules. And um, so um, you work through that at your own pace. But then we have a series of tutorials. So with each module, there's a corresponding tutorial. So every Monday night, we meet with all our students online. And um, so that really helps us to understand where they're at and what they're wanting to achieve and, you know, be in the best place to help them take their next step. Um, Once they're about halfway through the training, we get them to book in a strategy call because by that stage, they know enough, they know enough to start formulating their ideas on what their next step is. And that's where we look at what they've got. Are they making the most of that? Um, Some have negatively geared properties. We try and deal with those. Um, uh, Look at their family home. Are they maximising what they can be getting out of that? And then think about what the next step what the next project is and and map out a plan for them getting to the point that they where they don't have to work anymore. Once that's over, uh, people can come and just do that and nothing else, but most go on into the Wonder Women program and there are varying levels, but basically that's the, we have two three goals in that actually. One to monitor their progress through their and support them through their projects. Two, to broaden, to deepen their knowledge. So I've been in this for 40 years and I'm still learning new stuff. And so I, whatever I learn myself, I, um, I share that with our community. So I run masterclasses and, you know, a whole lot of bits and pieces. Three, to have, a, to be part of a really robust 
um, community, like mostly women, who are doing the same thing. So they're an amazing support, not just me, because they're all in the trenches renovating too. And four, if they want a joint venture partner, that's where they will find that person. So and so then so they have their plan for 12 months and then they, you know, go to town and work on it with our support um, to get to where they want to go. And so they if they they come in and do the the, the online training first and, and they're in the, the group that meets every Monday night. Uh, is that a, like a rolling intake of people coming in? Are they all at different stages? Um, so basically we do have an intake. Um, so we do a formal intake once a quarter. However, we do have people come in between because it doesn't really have to be done in quarters. I just do that to manage my workload. Um, right. But we do have people come in between that they will get in touch and say, you know, I'm really busting to get going and blah, 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 you know, discovered yesterday I hate my boss and, you know, I can't stand it a minute longer. Um, and so, yeah, we take them in because you can start at any time. It's just for me I just prefer to have a bit of order. So, yeah. Right. So you're you're running the – you've got this quarterly program and and so over Christmas you're still running like – No, we take about – we take about three weeks over Christmas. Right. So some of the – so we have a couple of levels of Wonder Women. One level is Sapphire and the other one is um, – we've got the base level, which is the 100K renovation boot camp, Wonder Women Sapphire, Wonder Women Diamonds. Diamonds I meet with every single week with exception to Christmas. So basically it's around – um, you know, making sure that they kick their goals and are accountable and are supported. Sapphires mm-hmm. are, like, we've got several levels levels of support, but that actual accountability meeting is really um, prized, I think the word is. Um, but we have lots of other things. Things like, um, so one of the side effects of being a, bringing up your kids on a building site is they, you know, get sucked in basically and um so our our son our only son has been drawing pictures of houses since he was two all he ever wanted to do was be an architect which I tried desperately to talk him out of it because it's not very well paid but anyhow money's not everything um and so now he consults to our business and one of the things he does which I absolutely love because most of our projects you don't have the budget to spend five or ten grand on an architect But he does this session where he will work out the concept for you. So you take your floor plan to him. For about $400, he will work out the concept for you. So if you can't afford to go any further than that, and for a lot of our renos, that's enough. So we get an architectural design without the big price tag. And that's, um, that's, you know, something that we're, we're able to offer that is quite unique. Um, Yeah, we've got, and of course, I did mention my husband's in construction. So he's, probably one of the top 50 project managers in construction in the country. Um, And so we also have him as a um, go-to person for construction. So I'm, my expertise is really like, obviously I'm a bit of an all-rounder because I've been doing it for a long time, but everything I learned about construction, I learned from him. Uh, But my sort of side of it is I'm more around the strategy and the, you know, the, I call it the housewife's resourcefulness meets professional project management, basically. Yeah. Right. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And so these women are really, they're, they're putting someone else to do most of the work. Are they doing any of themselves? Are they painting? Are they? Um, some do. Um, so some, like, um, we've got a student, she's relatively new. She came in less than 12 months ago, actually, and her husband had been retrenched. And so she is the driving force in the in the relationship, but he does the reno. So he does a lot of DIY. Right. Um, so most of it. And so, but as a result, like their first project, they paid $275 for and they sold it for mid fours, I think. And they made over a hundred thousand dollars on a very low buy-in because he did a lot of the work. Right. Um, so they're into we actually met with them on the weekend and they're into their second one. And um, and so now they're starting to think about 
um, where at what point in their progress where they will phase him out of the DIY mm. so that they can get more leverage because while he's in on the tools, they, you know, that, they were telling me things that I could just about scream, things like he drove to Sydney from Canberra to pick up a dishwasher and, like, they see now that it was a crazy thing to do and um, and he got stuck here. So they lost two weeks on their job because of COVID. He got stuck in Sydney. Oh, so, mm. like, yeah, so you've got to really rationalise what you're doing yourself. Even if he hadn't have got stuck, I, I said, you've got to factor in what he's worth in a day and it's got to be six to $800 a day mm. and it's cheaper to have it delivered. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, where did that come from? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm raving. I'll stay on track. <laughs> okay. All right. So... I'm just curious as the kind of people that come to you, how, like, what age group are they? Where, what's their background? Okay. Well, so we've got two main cohorts. So we've got quite a few women in their 30s who basically want to be stay at home mums. They don't want to, um, often they will come during maternity leave or right. they might have older children but want to and have got a little bit of um, capital behind them and want to make that shift. And then the other demographic are women in their 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. Like one of my best renovators, most prolific, is well into her 60s, okay? So, and that's the thing that I love about renovating because um, it, it doesn't discriminate. Mm -hmm. You can do this however you like. Mm -hmm. And so she was already retired when she came to us, but she had a goal to really get her family going and so and she's done you know some amazing things she's in melbourne too um but yeah so and usually the so the younger ones are usually mums and then in the middle there there's a lot of women who have had a bad relationship and um and you know sort of want to get they don't just want the financial benefit they're wanting some more joy in their life more creativity mm -hmm. Um, and then there's women that are in an older demographic that are getting organised for retirement and some are just doing it because they love doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that really, that is like exactly the kind of people I talk to. I talk to a lot of teachers coming off maternity leave and they're worried about the financial security for the future. They can't really afford to leave teaching, but they don't really want to go back because they know what a massive workload it is. And so yeah. something like this is an amazing yeah. opportunity. And for the person getting retrenched, there's a nest egg there already to get you started. So it's yeah. also and, and And the other thing is um, something that I noticed is often when someone has had a trauma or, you know, either lost their job or got retrenched or, you know, come out of a bad relationship, um, often make really, really bad decisions. You know, go to a property, decide they've got to do something, go to a property thing, end up buying something off the plan that is an absolute dud. Just about everything off the plan is a dud. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, I love to try. I, that's why I really try and get our message out there because, I want to try and get in before they start, mm. you know, going to these very slick um, uh, shows where they, yeah, end up. I always think you can't go too wrong with education, but when they they marry that up with the property purchase, it's a dangerous situation. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's what, just one more thing that we're doing at the moment. This is a new thing, which I absolutely love, is we... Our projects, so I always like to have a teaching project so that when someone's coming through a boot camp, they can see live how it works. And it's always been our project. And then I, uh, I've i got a financial planner um, in our student body who said to me, why don't you um, get all the students to put some money in and buy it in cash? And I thought, I didn't really know whether that would go, but I thought I would give it a go. Using it, the, um, we outsource the legals for our joint ventures, so I, you know, like which I find very liberating. And I found out from them we could have 20 people in a joint venture. So I put wow. the call out mm -hmm. and I ended up with 14 people and we've, between us all, we've put in, I've contributed as well, we've put in about $1.2 And so now we do our teaching project with um sort of as a group, as a big group, 
And so that's been really good because, um, yeah, it, I think it's just a lot better when it is actually the community that owns it and not just us. Yeah. And so they, it's also a great learning experience. Um, so we call that the class project. And nice. so that's the property I mentioned we've just bought. And we bought a house in Newcastle because um, 1.2 million does not buy you a house in Sydney in mm. an area where I would want to work. And so, yeah, so, and I'm mentoring one of our Wonder Women through that project. So I hope at some point in time, my dream is to have one of those projects in every capital city, mm. but we're just starting, as my husband said, don't get too far ahead of yourself. <laughs> That's an amazing idea. And so who who oversees that? Because if you've got 14 people, that must be hard okay. to... Okay, so manage. one of the things that we do in a joint venture is we nominate a renovator. One person takes responsibility, and that's me, obviously, because I'm I'm the custodian of other people's money. money. I want to make sure it's looked after. Yeah. Um, and so, and I report to the ho- the group as a whole, so they're across what's happening. Mm-hmm. But I work one on one with Kerry, who's our men- mentee. But uh, and she lives in Newcastle, which is great because while I'm in lockdown, I can't go up there. So right. she's able to deal with uh, on the site. Yeah, things. great. Yeah. So, and so, how do how do people source tradespeople? Because that seems to be one of the biggest for me. That would be one of the biggest issues uh, that would really want me uh, make me not want to do that. Yeah. So basically, we have a system for that, and it's really around the due diligence. Okay. So. Um, you know, people say to me all the time, I can't get good tradespeople, but I actually, I don't really have that problem because I do the due diligence on them. So when I'm um, when I'm inviting trades to quote, I will invite half a dozen and then I will check them all out, check their licence, check their reviews, do reference checks, um, check that they're covered for occupational health and safety. Mm. And then the other side of it is how you look after them. And the thing is, if you do that and you build a trade team and you're giving them regular work, you will find that they look after you as well. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we have is we have like a brains trust, like we've got people all over the country renovating Mm -hmm. and so sharing of trades. Like I've never done a reno in... um, in Newcastle, but I do have students there. So I'm saying to them, what trades have you got? Also, my buyer's agent, she's given me trades. So I, you know, I'm thinking it'll be interesting to see how I go when I've got no team and I'm in a new town, Mm. but I've managed to do it without too much trouble at all. So yeah. yeah. That's great. Because that would be the biggest thing for me. I'd be like, oh my gosh, we've had a few um, pretty hairy incidents uh, just on our own house with uh, people who've lied to us and stuff like that and, you know, got a couple of cases with VTAC at the moment. Really? (laughs) Wow. Sadly, one guy was like just uh, he's got a chain of victims to his uh, Uh, for his lies. And so so, did you do reference checks on him? uh, For that one, my husband found him, so I don't know, but he it was from a site, like a booking yeah. site. Oh, but, okay. Yeah. Okay. But he also has like false names and other things. It wasn't. I thought he he's went a out real of his, crook. He went out of his way. Yeah, that's right. It wasn't just us not not checking. <laughs> it wow. It was, wow. He's got a whole system in place. Anyway, that's another mm-hmm. story that probably doesn't need to be on this podcast. <laughs> well, look, but, the thing is, yeah. you are going to come up against people that are unscrupulous, and you do need. And that's why, because sometimes. People will say to me, students will say to me, do I really have to do this? And I'll say, well, do you want problems with your trades or not? Mm, if, you, yeah. if you don't want problems, yes, you do need to do it. Get them um, to ring me if they have any doubt. <laughs> I'll tell them the horror story. Oh, I had one situation where a student did a, look, a high-end renovation on a pla- in a place called Finger Wharf and she followed the process to a point but she skipped a minor part of the checking. So didn't check that his license, he was licensed to do the value of work he was doing. Yeah. And at the end, she she had all sorts of problems with him. And at the end, she um, couldn't get the certificates out of him. And then she found out that she had paid him for what used to be called homeowner's warranty. 
and he hadn't delivered the policy. And the reason he hadn't delivered the policy was because he was not licensed to do that value of work. Mm. So he'd done hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of work. Um, and so it was a it was a bit of a carry on to get them through that. But um, eventually they were able to complete it. They actually made oh, well over 300000 But it was just you do need to be dot your I's and cross your T's, unfortunately, mm. and that's the best way, you know, things like preparing a scope of work mm. um, so that you're, you've got documentation for what they've quoted on and you've got some means of something to go back to if they decide to charge for variations that you don't think uh, should be included. So just really just following, uh, you know, simple project management processes yeah yeah great wow this is mm. huge a fascinating conversation Do you think so <laughs> oh yeah it's awesome yeah. like I love that there's this whole hidden way for women particularly who often get caught up in this you know they've they don't have a lot of superannuation they get sick their partner gets sick and then suddenly they wake up one morning and they're like I don't want to go back to my teaching job it's really not doing it for me anymore, but I'm stuck there now because I cannot possibly do anything else. You've just opened up a door to a whole yeah. world of opportunity that they yeah. wouldn't have realised existed. So and, I think and that's the amazing. great thing is that I th- the thing that I really love about what I do is that as women, I think we tend to undersell ourselves. Mm. Like, and I love to see women really. Um, delivering on something that nobody thought that they were ever capable of. I think, and, you know, as women, one of the things that we love to do as mums is make our kids proud. Mm. And um, for your kids, seeing you sort of revel in that environment is, I think, uh, an absolute joy. And the other great thing about it, I don't know about you, but as a mother of four kids, I used to feel like there was a level of invisibility in it. Like you feel like you're someone's mum, you're someone's yeah. wife, but and it knocks all of that on the head because, you know, you minute you go somewhere and and someone says, oh, you know, what does your wife do? Oh, she's a renovator. Oh, really, is she? You know, like so, you know, it's like, it, you know, it gives you some sense of, which I know is superficial, but, you know, it's, um, you know, we are very tied to our identity. So as women, we deserve better than what we give ourselves. Nice one. Mm. All right. So before we wrap this up, Bernadette, I'm going to ask you one final question. What's yes. your favourite song? <laughs> so my favourite song, well, one of my favourite songs would be the Beatles' Blackbird. Ah, uh, and, it's, and it's music, but it's also a song. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Beautiful. No, it does have words. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I guess I'm thinking my daughter used to play it on the guitar, just the music side ah. of it. But yeah. No, it I really love fun. that. Yeah. And what what's yours? It it? What, what before you I answer that, what's it about that for you? What what is it about it's that? Just song? the melody. I just really love the, the melody. Mm. Yeah. Nice. What's mine? Uh one of my favorite songs, actually, I'm kind of slightly embarrassed to admit I was a big meatloaf fan in my teenage years. And the but the the right writer for Meatloaf was a guy called Jim Steinman, and there's a song I don't actually what's it called I don't even know what it's called but it's the the lyrics are the waves are pounding on the sand tonight I want to oh how does it go um, anyway the bit that I remember that I really love is that the sky is trembling and the moon is pale we're on the edge of forever and we're never going to fail and I just oh I love it. I love those sort of ballads, you know, the, those kind of song and this sort of haunting music as well. And what's it called? Surf's Up, that's what it's called. Ah. <laughs> yeah, beautiful song. I'm I love sure it. I have heard it, but, you know, I don't have, don't have much of a memory for um, for it, music. Yeah. It was probably, it wouldn't have been one of the more famous ones. It was, it was on the Jim Steinman album rather than a Meatloaf album. Okay. I also really love Meatloaf too, but... They're yeah. a bit, Pete, uh, you know, not for uh, general publication, most of his songs. So, <laughs> all right, we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you, Bernadette Jansen, so much for coming on the show today. You are very welcome, Elizabeth. Thanks so much for inviting me. I've enjoyed it. 
What a great episode. I really enjoyed that conversation with Bernadette. And I realized after we got off the call that I hadn't really promoted her website, which is the school of renovating.com. Uh, she also has a podcast called She Renovates. So if you're interested in finding out more about the work uh, Bernadette does, check out the website and the podcast. And I will put the links for those in the show notes for this episode as well. You've been listening to the Get Out of Teaching podcast presented by Larksong Enterprises with your host, Elizabeth Diakos. Do you know someone else who could benefit from hearing more stories of hope and transition from teachers all around the world? Please take a moment to share this and other episodes via your podcast app. Each share helps me reach listeners just like you who can benefit from this content. The Get Out of Teaching podcast is proud to be part of the Experts on Air podcast network. For show notes and other resources, please visit larksong.com.au forward slash podcast.